appreciate that? Yeah? I hope you remember that. All right. We, we have been enjoying, over, ever since this year started, 2021, a series entitled Living. And first of all, we looked at living as, as a son. Then we moved on to living as a priest. And now we're living as a priest king. This is the title of the, of the series that encapsulates the current teachings that, that we're, we're going, going through right now. So in all of this, we are looking at our identity. Please don't, please try as much as you can. Um, and I say this not to, um, I don't want to, to make you, well, how can I put this? I've realized that it's so easy for me to hear things and not to hear. You know what I'm saying? It's so easy to hear the instructions of the Word of God and yet not to hear because it makes no impression in our hearts. And so it makes no impression in, in, in our life. But we are looking at our identity in order that we would be able to understand our purpose and our identity. So many people in the church don't know what their identity is. They see themselves as Christians. They see themselves as good people. They could see themselves as, as a member of a local church. They could see themselves as saved. They could see themselves as disciples of the Lord. But they don't actually really know who they are. And, of course, the world has given the church so many different ways that they could see themselves. And as a result, we actually miss the mark. Um, I believe that every that it is the privilege of every single son of God. And obviously when I use the word son, I'm not speaking about male gender. I'm speaking about someone that's given their life to the Lord. I believe that every single son of God should be raised to maturity. Okay? That, that in itself is absolutely uh, uh, full of, of wonderful truths. Every son of God must be raised to maturity by putting on the mind of Christ so that they would be able to understand their birthright and then begin to walk in the predetermined way that God has set for them. Hmm? Let me say all of that again. You and I, as sons of God, must be raised to maturity by putting on the mind of Christ. Of course, the mind of Christ comes to us through the pure word of God. As the mind of Christ comes to us and we grow into maturity, then I begin to have an understanding of my birthright. Come on, how, how many of you, when you were four, five, six, even up to ten, understood your position in the family, in your, in your natural family? We don't. You can be born into a family, but totally oblivious of your birthright of what your possession is in, in the family. So we must put on the mind of Christ so we can understand our birthright. When we understand our birthright, only then do we begin to walk in the fulfillment of what God has planned for you and I. God has not planned for us to go to heaven. That, is not, that was not God's eternal plan. Okay? <laughs> Yes, we will go to heaven, and you know those of those that have gone on before us um, have gone to that wonderful place uh, called paradise. Paradise is like a park, isn't it? Okay, you know, in the spirit, you know, don't don't put your put your mind onto green hills and and big big you know um, nice big houses, because we're 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 spirit beings, and the Bible says absent from the body present with the Lord. So, and, and big, the big, aspect that we know, are looking at um, today, nice big houses, is because we're 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 so spirit as beings. we've looked the at Bible our says birthright, and that was the body present um, with you know, the Lord. In the last two so series, and, and big, that the aspect that we are looking at um, today, nice big houses, 
because we're, we're, Today, we're spirit so priests, we we've looked at living as a right, and that was the body present um, with you know, the in the last two so future is the same plan he has for us today and it's the plan that he had in his heart for you and I from eternity backwards if you can see how far that is so what I want us to look at today is I want us to, to, to grab something concerning priesthood you know I know that we're all comfortable in 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 understanding that, or at least having the, the, the name tag, the terminology, that I'm saved and that I'm a, I'm a son of God. Amen? You know, I mean, you, yeah. sons of God, can you lift up your hands? Yeah, if you're a son of God this morning, are you a priest of God? Because, you know, if we're a priest, we think, oh, if, if I'm a priest, what am I supposed to do? Because being a son speaks of your identity. Being... Speaking of a priest speaks of our function. And so we have to now begin to move our, our, our by minds in the right direction so that we will, and you know, as a man thinketh, so is he. Let me say this, this uh, uh, little bit of repetition that we looked at the last couple of weeks. Priesthood establishes the dominion of God's presence in the earth. I think this is the third week I'm, I'm saying this. Priesthood, and if you are part of the priesthood, part of our function is to establish the dominion, the rule, the government of God's presence. You know, we all know and that we've, we've all experienced when maybe we were in a room and somebody walked into the room with the wrong presence. And that whole, they established the, an environment in that place that was not comfortable. Imagine the presence of God coming into a room, coming into an environment, coming into an office place, coming into a school building or whatever it is. Priesthood establishes the dominion of God's presence in the earth. Priesthood preserves and maintains the presence of God, uh, of God's presence in the earth. Priesthood also sanctifies environments so that his culture and his customs can be established and God can dwell amongst his people. All of this has got to do with, with priesthood. And if, if, if this is so, obviously we've also got to understand that um, to be functioning in the priesthood demands the aspect of, of holiness. Now, you know, please, we don't want to, when I'm not going to go in that direction this morning, but please do not think of holiness as some religious uh, exercise that has been perpetrated and put forward in in the past but i want us to look at hebrews chapter 4 please sorry hebrews 1 hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4 i want to ask this question what is happening to us what is happening to us when we come to church what what what's happening you know um joseph uh, greeted us as a family and we are but it's not the family of the word of faith church even though, you know, on a local level, we could say that. But we are God's family. We are the family of God. We are not all of the family of God because there obviously has many other houses dotted all, all over the earth. And also there's the cloud of witnesses, which are still part of the family of God. Okay? But what is, what is God doing with us? When we come together... God's doing something. And I had a revelation the, the other day. I was chatting to Joseph about this. 
One day I looked out of our garden, you know, and we've got a big tree. And uh, suddenly this little scripture just popped into my, my heart that God calls us oaks of righteousness. Have you ever watched how quickly an oak grows? It doesn't. It grows so slowly, little by little, imperceptibly, slowly. And that's what's happening to you and me. God is causing his corporate church, of which we are part of, to slowly but methodically but most definitely grow. And sometimes there's a burst. You know, when springtime comes, there's a, there's a bit of a birth, uh, a bit of a burst forward. Winter, ah, <laughs> not so much, eh? We all shrink away. But Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4 says this. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance. Hmm? Now, we looked at the aspect of inheritance in the last sub-series. So we know that inheritance, we are joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Okay? So we have an inheritance. He, it says here, he has by inheritance. Hmm? If you've ever received an inheritance from somebody, you didn't work for it. You didn't have to do something. I like that. Who would like an inheritance? Absolutely. You don't have to work for it. It's yours. By birth. Hmm? So he has by what? Inheritance. Obtained a more excellent name than they. Speaking of, speaking of the angels. Now you say, well, that's Jesus. Yeah, but we are, that's, it's, this is speaking of Christ, isn't it? But we are the body of Christ. And the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this earth. So if he's obtained the name and we are in him, we have also received a name that is higher and more excellent than they. And we've gone, gone through this before that a name uh, depicts two things. First of all, it depicts our identity. It speaks of our character. It speaks of our nature. And when we have that, then we have the function. So you've got to know who you are before you know what you do. If you are a plumber, what do you do? You don't do operations in the, in, in the hospital. You fix the pipe. If you're an electrician, stay out of the plumbing business. If you are a, a, a religious person, you will do religious things. Isn't it? If you're saved, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> You'll do saved things. If you know that you're a son of God, then, well, you need to know what you must do as a son of God. So a name means more than just identifying you from somebody else. You know, my name being John, well, it doesn't just identify me from um, Joseph or anybody else. When in, 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 in the Hebrew culture, when somebody was named, and that word name is the word onomasio, it means to assign a label, to name something. And it means more than just identifying an individual, but it means the, almost the imposition of a, of a nature. It shifts things okay you'll remember in the old testament we've got people like jacob jacob was a nonsense he was a twister he was a supplanter but when he met with god he there was a wrestling and he emerged as a new person israel jacob speaks of the old nature israel speaks of the new creation, the new man in Christ. The old man was a twister, a supplanter, a liar and a cheat. Have you met anybody like that? Uh, in South Africa, we got one or two. Amen? Okay. 
the old man was a real nonsense. But when he met God and was changed, and his name, God changed, his, God said, no longer will your name be called Jacob. Your name will be called Israel. Israel means a prince, one who serves, sorry, one who rules as God. In the Hebrew, if you do the, do the, do the, the, the check up on that name, it actually means one who rules as God. And there's another side to it. It says a prince of, of God. And so you see the, the, the shift in there. We've also got people like Abram, exalted father, met with God, became Abraham, one who, uh, 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 um, father of, of many nations. Okay? Then in, in, in the New Testament, you've got Saul. Saul's name, sorry, Paul. I beg your pardon, Saul. Saul, who later was, became Paul, you know what Saul means? Desired. He was desirable to those around him. When he met with God, he became Paul. You know what Paul means? Little. Isn't it incredible? So, when, when we become a son, when we meet with God, before we are, before we have this meeting with the Lord, we're one of these twisters, these cheaters, where we're looking to be desirable for, you know, around everybody. When we meet with God, there's a renaming. When God renames you and me, there's a shift of character. God says to you and me, no longer will you, will you be a cheater. No, no longer will you be of, of, of this type. But now you are named, God calls you and me, one who rules as God. And I've already mentioned that in the priesthood, priesthood establishes the dominion of God's presence. And we're going to look at that a little bit later as, as we go forward. So this, this naming, this naturing, and this purpose that comes to us only comes as the result of engagement with God's word. Hmm? Obviously, as a man thinketh, so is he. It's as we, you know, we are what we eat. As we eat spiritually the word of God, that word become, must become flesh in us. So this, this naming, this, this character shift, this, uh, this preparation and maturing into the profession that God has called us to move in only comes as we engage the word of God. Obviously, it does not take place because one day I say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, and then boom, suddenly, you know, I, I'm, I'm walking in the image and the nature of God. It doesn't happen that way, okay? As I've already mentioned, a tree grows slowly. So this only takes, this, this, this shift comes, comes to bear upon our lives because it only takes place, the, rather, the, the father and the son are only revealed through the word of God that we have engagement with. Now, to, to help us to understand, this is where I want to, want to get to this morning. To help us to understand God's eternal plan, I want us to, to look at a particular individual. Um, we're not going to go there for sake of time um, in the scriptures. But many of you know that Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. Now, we've already looked at, and we've, you know, in the last series, we understand that the firstborn child belonged to the Lord. God says, whether it was of of mankind or whether it was of a beast, everything first belonged to the Lord. So, in the firstborn of every family, even before Jacob came on on, on the scene, In that firstborn, that one that was born first, he had birthright privilege. 
he had priesthood of his home. And if the father was not there, he would rule. I mean, those things are still basically around us today in, in almost all the cultures of the earth. If the, if the, the father's not there, the firstborn step, steps in. So let's now quickly bring the story into Jacob's life. Jacob had 12 sons, as you know. The firstborn was Reuben. So in Reuben was birthright, priesthood, and kingship. But then Reuben saw that his father Jacob was not loving his mother, which was Leah, as much as he loved the other woman, Rachel. Remember when Jacob went to Uncle Laban's house, he, want, you know, he, he fell in love with Rachel, wanting to marry her, but then Uncle Laban twisted him, and, and he married uh, Leah first. And then he had to work another seven years. Because Reuben was upset with his father, Reuben defiled his father's bed by going into uh, um, his father's concubine. Because he did that, God took the three anointings, the birthright, the, priest, uh, the birthright, the priesthood, and the kingship, and he split it into three. He gave that which was in one person to three other people. I believe that one of the reasons that he did that, that this is John speaking now, I believe that one of the reasons that God did that was so that we could study more carefully and clearly, more accurately, these three anointings. The birthright was given to uh, Joseph. Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel. Hmm? The priesthood was given to one of, one of uh, uh, Reuben's brothers called Levi. And the kingship was given to the fourth son, which was Judah. By the way, the reason that Joshua led the people of God across the River Jordan wasn't because he was, he was a faithful servant of Moses, but jo uh, Joshua was of the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim was... Uh, 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 he, had the, he had the birthright blessing when Reuben... Uh, defiled his father's bed, the birthright was given to Joseph. And Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And at the time, years later, um, you've got Joshua had the, was, was the leader of the tribe of Ephraim. And that's why he went across the, uh, the, the wh wh why he led the, the people of Israel across the River Jordan there. Okay? So, You've got these three, you've got the one, one person, Reuben. He messed up. God took those three and subdivided it into these three. And we can watch that all the way through in the Old Testament. When it comes to the New Testament, God now takes the birthright, the priesthood, and the kingship, brings it and reinstalls it into one. You remember that three always speaks of completeness of wholeness, spirit, soul, body, past, present, future, um, tithes, first fruits, offerings. You know, it's, it's, it's all, it always speaks of, of, of three, speaks of wholeness, completeness. And so now God brings these three special anointings and he brings it back into Christ. But now we are in Christ. And because we are in him, we have the firstborn privilege that in other words the first uh, the, the birthright of the firstborn but we also have priesthood the priesthood now comes upon us because if he is the high priest and we are in him we have the functionality of being a high priest because he is king we also have that dimension of of kingship can you see all of that so what I just, just want you to say this, 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 this phrase, the eternal plan of God has always been for the, these three anointings to rest in one. And it was always there. 
Even though it was split up in the Old Testament, God now brings it back into, into the new covenant. And so because we are seated, you know, Colossians 3 verse 1 says that, therefore, if you are seated together with him, set your mind on, on things above. Okay? So we are seated together with him. Where is he seated? At the right hand of the Father. Not physically, but it's all metaphorically speaking. But can we see that if we are in him as he is, so are we in, in this world. So we, we might all have different um, stations in life physically. You know, some may have a high station, some may have a low station. Some may have a lot of possessions, some people may not have so much. And, you know, it's so easy to just run after those things. But as a new creation, all of these three anointings, these special graces, these are ours. Um, and obviously, you know, no matter where we go, no matter where you and I go, the grace of God is upon us. The favor of God is always upon us. The problem is, is that so much of the church generally still believes in what? In getting the practices of the world in order to go through their difficulties. So if I've got, if I, if I want to make a way for myself in life, I'll resort to either giving a bribe or taking a bribe. Hmm? And I'll get myself hooked up into the snares of, of the world. Rather than believing that the grace of God is upon me, and the, which means the favor of God is upon me because we are his firstborn. You know, God says all of this to... to, to <laughs> what can we say? To try in, in an incredible way to, to, to impress us with, with, the, with this one fact. If you are God's firstborn, if we are seen as God as his only firstborn, that's what the word of God clearly tells us. Then God's eye is upon us. That means his favor is upon us. That means we, you and I don't have to go for bribes. We don't have to try to give a backhand to somebody. Let's walk free of the world system and believe God that when, when God says that uh, uh, his grace and his favor is upon us, let's walk that way. Amen? Yeah? Just look at your neighbor and say, money bribe me. All right, <laughs> whatever. So we've, we've got to have faith in what the Bible says. That's what we've got to do. And also, obviously, we can begin to, to walk with a sense of not only dignity, but, he, but divine immunity from, from things that, that are taking place. You know, uh, um, that even if we are in the lion's den, that God will shut that, the, the mouth of, of, of the lion. And unfortunately, you know, th there's, there's so much of the church that is, that is using um, the world's ways to get where we want to go in, in life. Um, there's, there's also still an alarming number of, of, of people, and I heard uh, Pastor Thamo say this the other day. There's an alarming number of people that will come to gatherings, such as ours even, yeah? hear the word of God, and then still go home and do as they choose and not obey the doctrine of the word of God. This is incredible. You know, but this is this is this is what this is what is taking place when we when we gather, when we come together, whether it's physically or even online. You know, we come together in the spirit, we sit around the table of the Lord to hear his word, which instructs us, directs us, corrects us, even at times gives us a little, you know. Discipline where we actually need it. Yeah? So, so basically priesthood speaks about our conformity into the heavenly way of life. That's what priesthood is actually uh, um, speaking about. Now, those of the priesthood, so... If you are firstborn, 
Let me say it nice and, nice and easy. If you are saved, if you've given your life to Jesus, please stop seeing yourself as being saved. If you're saved, that's wonderful. But now as we grow, we understand we are a son of God. If we are a son of God, then purely because we are a son of God, it means we are part of the family. Okay? In the family of God, I have a birthright. We have a birthright position. As because I have the birthright position, I must learn about my functionality in the earth. In other words, what is God's plan for me in the earth? Hmm? I know that much of, the, much of the church is focused purely on evangelism. Let's get another 10,000 people saved. And, and, and great for that. That's not God's eternal plan. Ooh, I better, I better just put a, a thingy in there. Hey, we are not against evangelism. We should get as many people saved as we can. But babies don't grow up babies. Hmm? We must grow to maturity. Remember what I said right at the very beginning. It is the privilege, it, it, is, the, it is the must for every single child of God to become a mature son of God by putting on the mind of Christ so they would know their birthright and know what they are supposed to do and to walk in it. Amen? That's why, and the pattern son is obviously Jesus. Hmm? Jesus could have come just, just as a man and said, I'm Jesus. And we wouldn't have known, you know, God didn't have to tell us that he was first born into the earth. And it took 30 years for him, born of an immaculate birth, you know, the anointing of God heavily upon him to come to maturity so that his ministry could start. But the church, and we are in, I need to be careful here because I want to run off on a track. We're in the third day, okay? And Jesus said, um, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. It's the third day, and we are being raised up in this day to function from the position of son, firstborn son, as a priest, king, okay? So, through those of the priesthood represent two realms. They represent God to the earth and they represent those in the earth to God. We actually join two realms together. I want us to look at, please, Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Wherever... You and I stand as functioning in, in the priesthood, heaven and earth meet. Hmm? Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 23, it says this. By the way, before, before we read this, this priesthood, this this one who knows how to function as a son, he joins heaven and earth together, as I said. This is the one that stands in the gap. This is not a prayer intercessor. That, that terminology was incorrect. It was a Pentecostal, charismatic terminology that messed up quite, a, quite an area of, of, of the church, but now we're come, we're bringing this back into into uh, um, accuracy. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, "Son of man, say to her, you are a land." This is so he's saying, "Speak to the children of God. You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst." So just watch here. He's speaking now about what the prophets are doing. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured people. They've taken treasure and precious things. 
They've made many widows in her midst. Her priests, another group of people, her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They've not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they've hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Another group of people. Her princes, okay? Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets, back to the prophets, this group of people again. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divine, divining, uh, divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God. When the Lord had not spoken, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery. This is now because that they've had these people that have been speaking to them and declaring to them. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Can you see this? Hmm? So here's the people of God. And there's, there's leaders. And these leaders are speaking lies. Heaven is not coming to them. God, there's no way for God to be able to speak and instruct and direct and care for his people. And God said, because of all this nonsense, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. But I couldn't find one. I want to tell you today, there's a lot of nonsense out there. And the church, you know, the church generally, you know, it's so far, it's, it's in, in such, it's in a terrible position. How many homes, how many businesses, how many places, even, even in Machabang here, are in a mess? And God is saying to you and I, I sought for a man. Oh, what man? It must be a, a man that knows who he is and then knows what his function is. So he's got to know his birthright. So God is not looking for, you notice it didn't say, so I sought for a child of God. It doesn't say, so I sought for a religious person. So I sought for a boy. No, I sought for a man. And obviously, you know, we, we don't put boys into kingship. If there's, a, if there's a boy that has the title of a king, he's given, I forget the name of it, there's, there's another person, isn't there, that, that looks after the boy until he's grown to full maturity, you know, naturally. God speaks to us in riddles and in types and in shadows, and we, we've got to, got to appreciate this one. And I'm, I'm sure that we do by now, because in Proverbs 25, 2, the Bible says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to sort them out, to find them out, okay? So there's a picture that's given to us, and actually Joseph spoke about this when he, when he actually uh, um, uh, uh, spoke a little bit earlier. There's a picture of Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis chapter 28. We're not going to go, go, go there now. In Genesis chapter 28, this is when Jacob comes to uh, this place uh, where, where he calls Bethel, but later on the house of God. And he has a dream, and he sees this ladder. And this ladder touches the earth, but it goes all the way up to heaven. And at the top of the ladder is God. And he sees these angels ascending and descending. And that's a riddle. That's a picture. That's a shadow. That's a foreshadowing of something. And then in John chapter 1, verse 51, if we could just put that up there, please. John chapter 1 and verse 51. Jesus is speaking to, I think it's Nathaniel. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open 
And the angels of God, now we understand that one of the meanings of the word, in fact, the major meaning of the word angel is the word messenger, okay? A messenger of God. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Hmm? So Jesus explains this ladder thing showing that access by God into the earth will come through a man and this man is called the Son of Man. Meaning that a human being will become the ladder. In other words, you won't see God coming into and through a physical temple made up of bricks and cement, but you'll see and experience God through one who knows how to connect two realms, one who knows how to position himself as a priest unto God because he understands his identity is called a son of God, one who is named, one who is natured, one who has given us an assignment, a job description as, as a son of God. So if God wants to look, so if God wants to come into a certain place, I wonder how many businesses or homes, places of work are represented here. Huh? And we will say, oh God, please make a difference. And God says, well, I'm looking for a way that I can come into that place and bring the dominion of my presence. But what I need to do is that I need to look for a son who's made in my image and likeness and one who knows now how to stand and to function as, as a priest. Don't think of priest of a priest with these, you know, with these strange religious ways that we have seen. People that will you know, put on strange garbs and wear a big hat or stand with a, 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 you know, a, a big staff in their hand and speak in, in, in strange ways. You know. Jesus never did that. Hey, can you imagine Jesus walking down the street with a big hat and a staff in his hand and a big cloak? And hello, I'm Jesus. And yet you've got these, I better stop, eh? <laughs> Seriously. You can see what the state the church is in. And people rush after that. Eh? Isn't it incredible how to receive truth is a lot harder than to receive the lie? That's why we've got so much fake news about the vaccinations and everything else in, in the world. Not just vaccinations, you know? So much fake news. And people love it. They say, oh, did you see this? Did you hear? Oh. And then you say, no, but it's fake. Ah, yeah, but you never know, do you? It's nonsense. Hey? <laughs> so there, there's an interface. This is what I want us to hear. There's an interface. And we become the intermediaries between heaven and, and earth. You know, in, in this... In this incredible place, um, in, in, in this, I mean, I want us to hear that, I want us to understand that we grow into this. I wanted to say that in this place where we stand between heaven and earth, in this place, in this position, in this privileged place, there will be intimate holy, amazing communications that will take place with the Lord. But do not think that you're going to do something, quickly kind of get into this place, and then you're going to be in this, you know, it might, you might, as we grow into this, into this place, it might only be just a, a word, an impression, a thought, but act on it, you know? Now, these things just drop into your heart. You know, it just, just it, and, and it, can be, it can be almost insignificant. But I want you to hear that God, this isn't, this isn't a doctrine of this local house. This is God speaking to us, eh? 
He's saying, I, 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 I want you to move into the functionality of being a priest unto, unto me. Unto God, that is, yeah? And as we move into this position, I mean, it, it'll be like a husband and a wife in, a, in, in, a, in their bedroom where, where there's just, you know, there's not, not talking and chatting, gossiping about people, but there's this, this openness. You know, nothing is hidden. There's no darkness. There's just open communication between one and the other. That's, that's what, this is what this, this, this place is, you know. You know, priesthood, priesthood in, in, in the Old Testament, um, and this is again a shadow. This is a picture. This is, this is how God is showing us about priesthood today. You know, I understand that we are part of the priesthood today. So I've got to find, what, 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 what you know, give me more examples, Lord. It's not enough just to say, we're in the priesthood, and they say, oh, good. And then we, then we kind of function. We have to go back into the, old, into the Old Testament to see the physical types and shadows and then discern what's taking place. The priesthood in the Old Testament, when the inheritance, hello, when the inheritance was dished out to the 12 tribes, the Levites were standing on the side saying, where's our land? Because each one of the tribes, each one of the 12 tribes, they got land given to them. But the Levites never got anything. But God took four tribes, sorry, four cities from each of these 12 tribes. Four twelves, 48. The Levites were placed into these 48 cities so that in each tribe there was four cities where Levites were present. What was God doing? God was establishing a witness and a presence of himself right there amongst them. God is showing. <laughs> so wherever they were, they were conscientizing, if you would, they were reminding the people. They were declaring. They were expanding. They were revealing the way that a person should live as his people and, and, unto God. And that there is a way where there is a people that are in conformity to, the, to, to, to God's heart and his ways. So wherever they were, Listen carefully now to this. Wherever they were, oh, and wherever we are, his presence was felt. Hmm? Don't think that we can come to church on a Sunday and expect the presence of God to come to us because the song service went well. And if the song service didn't go well, well, we miss out on the presence of God. That is an immature and incorrect understanding. They've got no mandate to bring the presence of God. We are carriers of the presence of God. You and I. You want the presence of God in your home? Position yourself. Now you, you don't just take a step like I did. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just say, who wants to be a priest? Let me just pray for you. Be a priest, be a priest, be a priest, be a priest. Now, how does it take place? Through receiving the word of God that comes to us as a son, as a firstborn. And we study, we listen, we learn, we keep going over and over and over and over and over and over again. I promise you, I listen to these teachings over and over and over and over and over again. Until, and, until one day it goes, oh my goodness, I see now what's taking place. I never saw it. I never knew it. Hmm? You want the presence of God in your home? You want the presence of God in, your, in, in the environment in which you, which you live in, in you know, whether it's at work or, or wherever? You are the carriers of God's presence. You and I, as we grow 
into the image and the likeness of God, we become his standard in, in the earth. So wherever they were, wherever we are, God was present. Boom. This is what we call God's ubiquitous presence. In other words, how God can be present in every place at the same time, it's through his people. Hmm? It's through us. Can you see the, the wrong concept that was brought into the church where years ago the one focus was to get to heaven? But God says, I want to get to the earth. And that's why the Lord's Prayer says, let it be done on, you know, as it is in heaven, let it be done down here on the earth. And then we carry on. In fact, um, we're not going to do this now because of time. I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer when you get home or sometime today. And pray it from the aspect of priesthood. And you see how it comes into it. In, in, it just, just opens up in, an, in another, another dimension. I was just praying this the other day and I thought, my Lord, this is all about priesthood. Hmm? Amazing, amazing the, the, the things that happen. So a shift is taking place, eh? I believe it. A shift is taking place. For, for, for too long, um, I think Christians have been Christians at, uh, in church. <laughs> and then when, when they get home, when they go to the marketplace, they're not such good Christians anymore. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of nonsense out there, hey? You know, you know, you believe me? But I, I believe that now that there's a, um, there's a shift coming in our understanding that we are actually the carriers of his presence. And wherever we are, the presence of God and the dominion, the effect, the government of his presence can, can be seen and can be felt. Amen? Our time is up. So we, we'll, we'll pick this up again next week but uh, I want you to stand please to your to your feet this morning how many would love to to be able to have the the presence of God in your homes amen all, all, all do eh? God is looking for a man a man now again that's without gender hey so, Father, as we lift up our hands before you today, Father, we say, here we are. Use us, Lord. Use us to be your intermediary. Teach us, Father, as one that would be able to stand in the gap. The one that would literally die to self and put all our ideas, our aspirations, our reputations down and allow heaven to touch our hearts and our minds and to govern every single aspect of our being. Father, the, the words that we speak and the way that we would speak, the looks of our eyes, the attentiveness of our ears, the gentleness of how we facilitate things with our hands. Father, everything about us Help us to be governed purely and totally by your wonderful world. And that governance, Father, is just bringing us to a place where we would really begin to function. So, Lord, I know that we're not going to make mistakes. I know we'll, we'll fall flat on our faces. We'll, we'll think we're going to do, do right. We're going to do this. And then we're going to find ourselves in a difficult place where we've blew it, where we've blown it. But Father, we thank you that as your family, we're all in different positions of growth. And your grace, your mercy is upon us. So Father, we thank you even before those mistakes for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your mercy. And so Lord, as we prepare to live our lives this coming week, and as we prepare to live our lives as your representatives, as your priests in the earth, Father, I pray your grace, the empowering ability of your spirit 
to be imparted into every single spirit that's standing here today and even listening online. Father, I bless each one. I pray, Father, for an overflow of the illumination of your word into our hearts and our minds. Father, may our homes indeed be a place where righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit will reign. Father, may your rulership come and settle the wars in our minds, in our hearts, in our, in our businesses. May we be um, peacemakers and not warmongers. Father, may our hearts be stilled and steadied and know that it is fine because we have a Father in heaven who loves, who looks after us and leads us every day. So, Father, may great grace, blessing and peace be upon each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for his words. Shall we? Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, you, you, um, I tell you what, while you're standing, we've got the, we've got the baskets here. Um, we actually haven't prepared anything for, for offering, um, but we know what to do. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And giving is really a sign of um, our faith in God that he will indeed provide for us according to his word. So I think while we just sing this song, um, maybe you just like to come out carefully so you don't crowd each other and uh, give, give our offerings. Thank you. first line of that song up there please look at that who is like you Lord in all the earth can I ask that question yes come on put up your hands me me so who is like the Lord in all the earth come me us it shifts it doesn't it hey is it incredible look we there may be one or two flaws. <laughs> There's one or two wrinkles that still need to be ironed out. But God is faithful. 
And what he started, he will complete. So go in the peace of the Lord. Go in the rest of the Lord. And go and live like the Lord. And join heaven and earth. And bring his presence in, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and we'll see you next week. Amen. God bless.